What is up, Mentors Collective? Welcome to another awesome episode. Today is going to be a fun one because I guarantee you that we're going to talk about a business and a product that you all know and love. That is liquor. Uh, so have you ever wondered what it took to start, build, and distribute your own liquor company? This is going to be an episode for you. Uh, and I'm super excited to learn about this as well because we always see you know, celebrity endorsed liquor brands. We're brand loyal to, to several different liquors. Uh, so we wonder what kind of goes into that. How, you know, where do they get it from? How do they market? How do they distribute? So in this episode, I'm I'm super excited to dive deep with a friend of mine, Tina Kara. She's a singer songwriter and founder of Tina's Vodka. Uh, Tina, welcome to the show. Super excited to have you. Thank you. It's great to be here. And you're Tina. You're Tina, the founder of Tina's Vodka. Uh, very exciting. It sounds kind of like Tito's Vodka. Uh, one that we're all very familiar with. Uh, and I'm, I'm excited to kind of dig, dig, pick your brain into why you decided to start this liquor company and what it took to get it to a point of kind of profitability. I imagine there's so much competition out there. Uh, so why don't you start off kind of telling me the elevator pitch, the founder story. How did, how did this all happen? And, and for those of you uh, watching on, on YouTube or video, it's a beautiful bottle she just held yes, up there. Yes, um, yes, yes. Check that out. So Tina... Talk, talk to me. What's up? So I grew up in a restaurant. I'm from a Greek immigrant family. Of course, I grew up working, washing dishes when I was a kid and then went to college in UNC Chapel Hill. I'm from Charlotte, North Carolina originally, then moved out to L.A. pursuing a dream as a songwriter and, of course, started working in bars and restaurants. And then I became the liquor buyer for quite a few places, just just through evolution, just getting to know the business and talking to people. And then one thing I realized with buying liquor is that the, most of the domestic brands are made of GMOs or have a lot of pesticides. And I wanted to have a domestic brand that was non-GMO, organic, no pesticides in the process at all, or no Roundup, anything like that. If they're, um, And then to have it at a good price and also taste really good because I've been pitched everything because we have such buying power with the company I work for. And they might have some of those qualities, but not all of them. So I really, because I'm a vodka drinker and I wanted to have something clean and good. And we really did achieve that with my brand. Very cool. Yeah. And yeah. you guys, if you're listening and you haven't already done like a distillery tour, it was one of the coolest experiences of my life, going to actually see how it's made from start to finish. And Tina, I'm sure you're an expert in that by now, but not only the distilling process, but like where the ingredients come from. Yes. So kind of talk to me a little about that, the very kind of beginner's novice tutorial on how vodka is made and sourced. Well, the first thing is to figure out what you're going to make it out of, because you can, vodka is unlike most spirits, where it's like tequila has to have agave at a certain percentage or scotch or whiskey have to have certain percentages. You can literally make vodka out of anything. I've seen strawberry, quinoa, rice, corn, wheat, anything, and it does affect the flavor. So you'll, you, you can still, there's a little subtlety that comes through even after the distillation process. It's kind of like when you're making a soup, whatever that base is, whether it be vegetable or beef. I tried to make a soup once with a uh, kale infused and the kale basically ruined the soup <laughs> because the flavor does linger. And so that's why starting with a good organic source was really important to me. So I grew up eating grits in the South. I'm from North Carolina. And I really like the flavor and the way corn vodkas mix. I feel like they're smoother. There's a better taste. There's a better smell. And so I worked with my team to source the best corn we could get. It's out of Wisconsin. Very and so, cool. And yeah. do you kind of manage the whole process from buying the corn all the way through distilling? Or do you have partners and vendors along the way that, that help you with that? Because I imagine that's very expensive and probably requires a lot of space and supply yes. chain. So tell me about that. Yeah. So the team I'm working with is called Sunset Distillers, and they do a lot of that for me. So I help supervise and look along the chain and they send everything to me for approval, but they have those things in place. They've already vetted the vendors. They've already done a lot of that. So they made it actually really easy for me to tell them what I want to get and then cut out a lot of that legwork for sure. And the non-GMO corn, I bet, is uh, an interesting thing to have to seek out and put on your label. Uh, where do you kind of get the corn from? Do you work directly with the farmers? 
Yes, my team does. They work directly with the farmers and chose the corn. And that's one thing, Ray DiGilio, he is my um, distiller. And he and I worked on it together and did several tastings back and forth about how we want it to be. And then we had this other idea that um, he's, it's a proprietary method, so I can't tell you too much about it. But it, after we distill the corn, we then filter it through a very specialized filter that involves or, organic coconut shells, and it removes all the impurities. So it's like medicinally grade, medicinally grade clean. So when you drink my vodka, it has a little bit of a different mouthfeel, and it's this cleanest vodka you're going to have. And no and I, hangover. I <laughs> well, I legally can't say that, but I've heard a lot of people tell me that. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. You're not allowed to legally claim that you, you your vodka won't give a hangover, at least maybe a reduced hangover. No, I can't. No, the TTB. There's probably the, all kinds of rules, huh? With oh, uh, a, being in the liquor business. Yeah, with the you can never say that alcohol is healthy. Um, it's very interesting because you know there's a government warning on it. There's like you know it can cause birth defects. I can show it to you here. On well, you can't see it, but um. So that's part of the interesting thing. But, you know, there's different qualities of alcohol. And one thing that I can talk about is what non-GMO, the impact it has on the environment. So one thing that I think people don't realize is that when you're buying GMO, you're not just supporting the GMO portion. It is sprayed with pesticides like glyphosate. It is terrible. They, you know, they're wearing hazmats. Out, hazmat suits out there while they're spraying the fields that you're going to eat one day. <laughs> so what you're doing when you're buying products that are made of GMO corn or any other GMO, you're supporting more of that. So it's so bad for the environment. It goes into the soil. It depletes everything. And so what I can talk about is how my vodka does not do that. I support the organic. When you buy from my corn, my vodka made from the corn we get, it's actually replenishing the earth. There's bugs, there's bees, there's proper soil, healthy soil that is grown out of. And then we're in turn supporting those types of farmers who were making the planet cleaner and better. And actually I have a partnership with Kiss the Ground. Have you seen that film? It's a documentary no. film. Tell it's me a, a bit about that. Oh, it's amazing. It's a documentary film about how regenerative agriculture will basically solve all the problems we have in the climate from runoff to um, droughts and everything because it's the microclimates that are being destroyed because of the lack of the soil health. When right. the soil is healthy, it automatically draws, they call it drawdown. They, it automatically pulls the CO2 back into the ground, puts it into a plant where it belongs. And then our planet is so sophisticated and smart, it knows exactly what minerals to disperse throughout the soil. Give it to this type of grass. Give it to the you know, like kale is supposed to absorb all the toxins. That's why you shouldn't eat kale. <laughs> I just learned that recently. And, Dave Asprey? Um, yes. Yeah. <laughs> I loved him. He's a friend. <laughs> oh, he's, oh he's nice. Oh, very cool. I, I'm a big fan. Yeah. Um, I stopped doing quite a few things because of him. And it's I can tell the difference. It's, he's very intelligent. Um, but so how Kiss the Ground is where they think there's this whole story. This one guy who was on, you know, the one source cr crop where it's just like soy or wheat and using all the chemicals. And he kept getting destroyed by the, uh, what do you call those? Uh, the hail, all the weather just destroyed his crops. And then he ended up going to regenerative agriculture, which is a completely different way of farming. And now he's so resilient. If a hailstorm comes, it doesn't matter because his crops are strong. His soil is healthy. And that's part of life, having weather. And so when you have a crop that's diversified and full of organic produce, and, you know, they also talk about the cows or the methane from the cows is such a big problem. You know, the problem isn't the cows, my cat's joining us. Um, it's because the cows were supposed to be walking around live around the agriculture and pooping into the ground and that's supposed to go into the earth and it's fertilizer. So now when you have the livestock decoupled from agriculture, the poop just sits there and goes straight up into the atmosphere. So basically kiss the ground is about how getting back into the way farming was before big agriculture came in and separated things and started using pesticides and the earth will just, the earth is intelligent and knows what to do. You know, remember the pandemic, the first couple of weeks of the lockdown when the water and the 
the air was so clean within a few weeks because the humans weren't messing it up. So it's that's how quickly the earth can change things. Yeah, definitely a, a big proponent of regenerative farming. I'm going to check yes. out this documentary, but outside of yes. that, I've definitely been following it. Uh, and yes. right, wasn't that crazy during COVID when you just saw kind of the world clear up over the course of a couple of weeks? Yes. Uh, kind of insane. It was exciting. It was actually a relief. It's like the earth is just, it can clean it up like that. We're not doomed like this 12 years. Oh, we're going to die. I don't, I don't believe that. Um, we've been hearing that for hundreds of years anyway. Right. Um, <laughs> but this, the reason why I was so moved by Kiss the Ground is because it's a new climate story that leaves you with solutions and with optimism. Like these are things you can do right now. And I'm, I'm in a big city. I don't even have a backyard. It's just concrete where I am. But what I can do is support farmers and food and restaurants that purchase from regenerative sources, organic sources. And yes, it is more expensive, but it, in the long term, it costs you less because it's helping on the environment on so many levels. And, and I so, think you feel the difference when you consume organic, grass-fed, and non-GMO materials. I only yes. eat grass-fed beef, and I, I know that there's a difference. My body knows there's a difference. So it's not just the financial cost. I think there's a cost to your health when you yes. make that decision. Exactly. And then they talk of one thing that I learned through the vodka is how much of the GMO corn is going to feed um the other cows. So yeah, the grass fed is even more important because you're going to get those pesticides through the, through the meat of the cow if it's not grass fed. So it's, it's, it's insane how, how it gets into everything. But like you're saying, you feel better. Your body is like, thank you. This is real food. I, I know what to do with it. hundred uh, percent. So got, got a little off track, but I'm, I am really passionate about kind of regenerative agriculture yes. and feeding your body the right stuff. Yes. But it sounds like you've created uh, a good, clean product that yes. is not only tastes good, but is healthier. I know we're not allowed to say healthy. You can say uh, it. I can say it. A healthy <laughs> vodka, the healthiest <laughs> vodka on the market. But in this day and age, even with the best product on earth, right, you're still, you still need to stick out. There's probably boatloads of competitions. I don't know how many different vodka companies there are, but I can imagine it's quite a few. Oh, yeah. So, there's tons. How did you find that process of marketing, branding, sticking out from the pack and becoming a, a successful vodka company? What was that like? Um, well, I'm still brand new to the market. I've right. been in the market for about a year and a half. And then now I'm with the biggest distributor in the, in North America, actually, I'm with Southern Wine Spirits, who are awesome. Quick. I love them. Yes, they're amazing. And um, I would say the biggest thing is, one thing is in advantageous right now, which wasn't always, is to be female owned. So that's working in my favor finally. And um, it's 100% female owned. And I have a, really a truly authentic story of how I, you know, have been in the business a long time, learn how to streamline menus and work with brands and make things that are successful, give the customer what they want. And one thing I think a lot of people want is the non-GMO, organic, American-made brands. And so there was a niche and I it all kind of culminated together. Like I, I was telling people, it's like my whole life now makes sense. It was like I was doing a wax on, wax off my whole life. And now I'm like, oh, this is why you were doing this and this. Because, you know, liquor is very separate from being a songwriter. But now they've all come together. So I think... Really just having the life experience working in the business was a huge advantage working from the buyer side because now I understand when I go talk to buyers what they need, what they're looking for, how to talk to them instead of just selling, which, you know, I've seen it all because I was in a lot of big venues and I've seen all types of salespeople and I know what works for me and what doesn't. And I try to apply that to my company now. And you said you, before this, you worked as a liquor buyer. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. Okay. So that definitely kind of helped. You were able to flip the script and know yes. what worked on you from the buying perspective. Totally. Uh, so you got to kind of see the industry from every side, which is, yes. I think, really helpful for, for anyone in a professional space like that. Yes. And the number one thing is the product has to be good. You'd be surprised how many products, like you're saying, there's tons of brands out there. And of course, taste is subjective, but I was surprised at how many bad products are out there. 
you know, how many, there's one brand, there was a colleague and they're like, can you buy some, but our vodka is a favorite. This is like five years ago. And I was shocked at how bad the vodka was. It was organic, non-GMO, and it was awful. I'm like, oh, oh this is tough. So that was the number one thing. The product has to be good because amount of marketing, all it comes down to is what's in the bottle. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I'd love to know a little bit more about what process you went through to make sure that you had a good tasting product. Uh, was that just kind of you and your friends tasting a couple different batches, different methods? What, what was that like? How did you get to the product that you have now? Yes, yeah, so Sunset Distillers, who um, I'm working with, we went back and forth over a few different um, batches, yeah, and decided, okay, this is the one when we finally came through it. And, you know, that's the thing, during the pandemic, it actually gave us more time to do that, <laughs> to go through a little bit more and um, really, you know, I went through a few different labels. I went through a few different bottles. So with the world shut down and basically coming to a halt, it helped us really perfect what we were going to do. And I have to give a shout out to Michael Muhammad. He's one of the founders of Sunset Distillers, and he's an amazing person to work with and has been wonderful through this whole process of helping me create my vision uh, with his company. Yeah, very cool. And I know a few friends who are in, uh, I guess I don't even know what the industry is, like products that are in big retailers, big stores that need to find a distributor to get them into those stores. Yes. And my perspective of this, and correct me if I'm wrong, that finding a distributor to take your product and to work on your behalf is kind of like finding a, an agency as an artist. Uh, who's going to actively be out there pushing your product, trying to get it into stores, utilizing their relationships. Is that so far correct? Yes, you're absolutely correct. Okay, awesome. So I guess what is the advice for people who have, uh, whether it be a food product, uh, a cosmetic product, or a product like you have in the, uh, the vodka, to finding a, a good distributor? Because uh, I imagine that's kind of the, the, the key. Once you find the distributor, you, you should be okay. What did it take for you to get that distributor? Well, I've been working, I've been a buyer for over 10 years. So I knew all the distributors pretty well from that perspective. And so I knew that I wanted to work with Southern. I work with them the most. I have a lot of my close friends work there. And just through life experience, I knew they were the ones for me. But it's still very difficult to get in because they're a national company. So we had to get approval through the Texas branch first. And once we got the approval there, uh, my dear friend and um, colleague, Sarah Deem, on the craft side, brought me in through her division at, in California. So that was a huge, huge thing to be with Southern. And you're right. It is. I, don't, I can't really comment on other products because with alcohol, you have to have a distributor. There is no, we, there, you always have to, unless you have your own distributor license. There's a bunch of licenses that go into that, but this way the three-tier system is federal law and state law and then counties have their own laws it it gets very complicated but um for liquor yes getting in with the big distributor was huge because the small distributors they still can do it legally but then you're asking a buyer to open up a whole nother account have another set of invoices just for your brand and then there can be minimums and it's a lot to ask Someone, especially me as a buyer, it's like, oh, do I have to really do another credit report, you know, a credit app and all this just for one brand? It's like, just wait till you're with a big person. So now when I go pitch my brand, I'll just add it to your Southern order because everybody has that. So that was interesting. Huge, I didn't know yeah. that it worked that way. Uh, it's almost, I don't want to say unfair, but uh, for a lot of these smaller liquor companies that maybe can't get in with these big distributors that don't have a chance. Uh, so what are, what are some of the things that these big distributors are looking for? Obviously you have to have a good product, yes. but other, other than that, is there anything being a female founder is a great example. That's something that maybe they were looking on bringing into their, their client book. Other than those two things, can you think of anything that people might find useful for getting those relationships? Yes. I think having a track record, cause usually you do build through a small distributor and you just show these are the accounts we've already gotten. We're already in X amount of restaurants, bars, music venues, grocery stores, like build a track record that way. And a lot of places do have huge accounts with, you know, they have accounts with multiple, multiple distributors. So it's not a problem for like, say a grocery store, but I'm talking about like other bars and restaurants. They have so much going on. There's so much chaos. It's just a lot to ask them to do that. 
But I would say, yeah, build a track record and have a good story. Have something authentic that people want to talk about. And why should I buy your brand over someone else's? But I think ultimately it really does come down to the quality of the product because as far as all the brands I've been pitched, there's like five that I go back to all the time and some that I never will drink, no matter how much you market it to me. <laughs> Would you consider yourself kind of an expert in the vodka space? I think so. Yes, I drink vodka. I love martinis. I love Bloody Marys, Moscow Mules. And that's another thing that I think people... I'm, I'm, I'm unique in that is that I understand I've gone to so many tastings. Like there's yeah. formulas from, from like Europe, they're 300 year old formulas. There's a lot of craftsmanship that goes into making spirits. There's a lot of pride in that, especially the European brands. Cause they never dealt with prohibition. Yeah. <laughs> they were always legal. So they were, they never broke any of those, uh, formulas. They're still doing the same thing. And it's really cool to see, you know, it, here in America too, go into a winery and they talk about the process, how they choose the grapes. There's a lot that goes into making a spirit. It's like, like being a chef, you know, creating a nice meal. Look at these notes. Look at how this viscosity, there's so much to it. People are very passionate about it. And it's a whole industry. I tell people, you know, people might have their hangups about drinking, but it's like, that's what keeps the lights on in your music venues, sporting events, is the alcohol. So as much as, of course, you should drink responsibly, but alcohol is a huge part of our um, economy and not just itself, but it, how it influences other economy, other, uh, what do you call that? Industries. And the profit margins at some of these clubs are just unbelievable. <laughs> yes. Isn't it crazy? <laughs> bottle Pay $50 service. for a drink someplace. Yeah. I get a bottle for $2,000 and you turn around and <laughs> sell them that bottle for 30, $40. It's astronomical. <laughs> it's insane. Yeah, it is. All right. So let's have some fun uh, okay. as a vodka expert. Let's yes. talk about some of the popular vodkas people are really familiar with. Okay. Any of them that you can point out that are highly underrated or highly overrated? Uh, um, I don't know if I should comment on overrated. Um, <laughs> it's okay. I don't think they'll see this, but maybe. <laughs> Well, I think that um, I've always been a big fan of Kettle One because one thing I do like that they've had, they were like, that's part of the name is the same Kettle from like 300 years ago. It's still family owned business. I've actually met the heirs in Orange County. They're very nice people, the Nolet family. So I think that's a cool thing that's just been around for hundreds of years. And I, I used to know the owner, the heir to Grand Marnier for a while. And same thing. They were very, very... Um, proud of the, the oranges they would use and the way they made the cognac. No, it's not a vodka. Um, but other vodkas, I look for organic and non-GMO all the time. Because you'd be surprised. Are there any other popular organic non-GMOs on, on the market? Because I don't think I've seen any, but then again, I don't think I'm looking. Yeah, I know there's there's a lot. There is a lot out there now, but, but like I said, I'm not the biggest fan of how they taste. Um, yeah. I have a unique vodka. I know people say, oh, it's just another vodka. What difference does it make? But the way I, the way I look at it, it's like that's whatever's going in your body, you should be very scrutin. You should scrutinize that because it, like you said, you can tell the difference when you eat grass fed beef versus when you don't. Um, my vodka with the extra filtration that we do really sets it apart. I'm unlike other vodkas because of that. You can taste and feel it. Um, I have to send you a bottle. You are do. You, I was just yeah. going to say, you got to get me a bottle. I <laughs> yeah, promise you, to drink it yeah, and report sure. back. Yes. Yes. So that's why I feel like I can't really compare my vodka to other vodkas. It, it, it right. really is a unique, a very unique thing that when you drink it, you taste and feel the difference. Actually, I just have to share an Instagram post. Somebody posted that it was at a tasting up in Ventura County. And he's like, I, this is not a paid promo, but I've been making cocktails with it. And I feel a difference when I drink your vodka. Yes. Wow. So that's a great endorsement. Yes. Yes. Um, so that's the feedback I've been getting. And with myself, usually I'm a lightweight. If I have more than two cocktails, I can tell I have a headache. I feel terrible the next day. I've never had that with mine. Um, we even have had five or six drinks, so I'm not so saying that's for everyone. you probably haven't been everyone. drinking enough of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, but that's my experience of it. Um, that that's why we, because especially as being a buyer and someone who's in the industry, tons of vodkas out there, you know, and I feel like tequilas and whiskeys, they can be more expensive because people expect that. They know there's more subtleties because there is a flavor. There is a formula. 
And with vodka, since it is supposed to be odorless and colorless, it can be dismissed a lot. And that's yeah. why I was looking to do something where it wouldn't be fall in that category where you're like, oh, wait, no, this vodka actually is different. So that's what that's what we set out to do. And we and I, I believe we accomplished that. Yeah, I'd say vodka is interesting because it's not usually drank by itself unless my friends are Russian. I spent a lot of time <laughs> at dinners at their house. They drink yes, it straight. Yes, yeah. Yeah, a lot of vodka. Um, whereas tequilas and whiskeys and, and, and things of that nature are more sipping drinks oftentimes. Yeah. Or you're doing a straight shot of tequila mm -hmm. or a whiskey uh, on the rocks. Do you drink your vodka straight or do you typically mix? And what, do you, what kind of mixed drinks do you usually make? I'll do it on the rocks. If I go out, I usually do it on the rocks. And I just, it's because mine has like a very, there's a subtle sweetness because of the organic corn. And then sometimes when I'm at home, I'll have a Bloody Mary or a mule or a martini. I'm just very picky about the olives. I'm picky about the mixers yeah. because there can be high fructose corn syrup in the mixer or some food coloring. So unless I can control it completely, I usually just get it on the rocks. I don't even get a garnish because I just like it to be clean and exactly what I think it is. Yeah. I also love my Bloody Marys in the morning and yes. usually martinis at night when I'm at like a lounge, I'll yes. go martini. Uh, not so much else other than other than those things. I also like beer. Oh, nice. uh, That's smart talk to me about the distribution. If you're looking for Tina's Vodka or you're at a lounge or a bar yes. or a club, is that something people can, can ask for, can order at the bar? Yes, but only in California right now. Cool. So we're starting here, and we do plan to ex expand, expand to other markets as soon as we can. Um, you know, COVID, we're still dealing with a lot of those delays, like getting the glass. I actually just placed an order for uh, my custom bottle that I'm getting made. I can show it to you if you want. I'm getting it. Yeah, let, let's see it, and yes. we can try and describe it for the yes. listeners. So I have on my label to continue the story of my vodka, I have Athena's owl on the label, and it's sitting on top of a tree earth. So Athena's Greek woman. And... The owl represents her, the female ownership, and the wisdom of planet Earth. That's why I have the tree, which is shaped like the planets. Like if you look close, you can see the leaves are the continents. So I have the owl embossed in the glass here. Cool. And then on the back, I have the alpha and omega, because I have on the front label, I have the alpha and omega in the grass on the label that is representative of the seeds that you uh, so are the seeds that you harvest. So you start with a good base and you end up with a good product. And then I have American made embossed in the bottom and the front. And then the word Gnosis, uh, it's a Greek word for knowledge. So I have a little bit of Easter eggs all over my label and my bottle. And I'm really excited That's cool. about it. Looks like a, a lot of work going into the bottle. Yes. Yes. But I guess it's the subtleties that make it make it stand out, make it special. Yes, because one thing, all the feedback we've gotten from literally every walk of life, every race, every sex is like, oh, I love that owl, which is awesome because I love the owl too. So we wanted to even have the bottle maybe be a keepsake for like plants, like a vase or for candles to keep afterwards and have the cute little owl embossed in it. I like that. Why an owl? Like nocturnal? Stay well, up all night. Well, those two. <laughs> but it's Athena's owl, Bubo. Did you ever see the, sh the film? Not not the one recently, but from the 80s, uh, Clash of the Titans. Did you ever see that film? I saw the new one, not the one okay. from the 80s. Oh, yeah. The, the one from the 80s is way better. Um, but it's that owl has a huge prominent role in it. But um, Athena's owl, because she's like the patron saint of Athens. And she's also right. the goddess of war. You know, yeah. she's a child of Zeus, so there's a lot of symbolism of of her being a strong woman in a male-dominated situation, which is what I'm doing. <laughs> there's very few female-owned brands in the liquor world. There's very few female executives in the distribution and on the supplier side. So, And the women are coming up. There's more and more women that I'm working with, but it's rare to have a female-owned brand in the market. Yeah, pioneer. Uh, that's that's yes. incredible. And what is it going to take for Tina's Vodka, to, I guess, to be a household name, to be in every hmm. bar in the country? What is next and what that uh, trajectory look like? That's a great, great question. Um, well, now that we're finally in the market, 
we've got our glass bottles. We got the corn. We're, we have product. Um, I'm launching it with my music as well. I'm a singer songwriter. So I've been holding, we actually went to mastering with my record right as the world shut down. So now we're launching both together. So my music is kind of the same vein where it's about optimism about the planet, about who we are, the power we have within us. And I would love to see my brand everywhere. I just got into a new chain. I got into Albertson's Fawns and Pavilions, and I'm opening new accounts throughout California, meeting new people, talking about my brand. So I'm hoping things like this, word of mouth, the people talking about how much they enjoy the vodka, I think that's going to be the biggest thing. So when people start asking for it in places, that that's a game changer because right. it doesn't, you know, that sets you apart from everything. So you do things, we're just plugging along and hoping to tell everybody I know about it, then tell them, tell them, tell their friends. <laughs> right. And with a quality product, the word will spread. Yes. Yes. Cause we got to like, get me a bottle. We'll do a yes. post and a, a little uh, taste test review. Sure. It'll be fun. For sure. But like that guy in Ventura, he's telling all his friends how much he enjoyed my vodka, posting about it, telling his friends to tell his friends and they're going to the store asking for it. Like that's, you can't even, you know, that's just very authentic. And that's what right. I want. Can't I don't want to pay for something like yes. that. Yes. And I want it to be authentic. You should drink what yeah. you want to drink. I'm not going to hard sell you. My vodka is not for everybody. It's for people yeah. who want something clean that gives back to the environment. Oh yes. And you have to watch kiss the ground. You're going to love it. Um, I will. Yeah. I'm an official partner with them. My logo's on their website. Theirs is on mine. And, um, my dream when you see the film is to go to a farmer in the Midwest and help them convert their farm from the one crop to a regenerative crop and have Tina's vodka pay for their plow, pay for whatever they need. Cause we're all in this together. You know, what's right. the point of having a successful brand if the air is so dirty and the food is so contaminated, everybody's so unhealthy. I want to live on a healthy planet and I want to contribute to that as much as I can in any way I can through my vodka, my music or anything I do on a daily basis to, you know, we live on the garden of Eden. We can get it back to that. I really do believe that. They say that in the film, but I've always thought that too. It is amazing how smart our earth is. And if we just kind of use what's, what's already kind of naturally built into it, we can get back to a good place. Yes. They talk about cooperation is the new thing, yeah. not competition, co cooperation. We can right. all win and thrive together. For those listening that want to try Tina's vodka, I actually don't know if you can buy vodka online or buy any liquor you online. Can. I've never done it. You Tell can. Me, can you? you absolutely can. So right now, depends on the state you're in. There's about 44 states that allow you to ship it into your state. Like from California, um, there's a link on my website. Um, I have a shipper. Just click on that, and he'll. You do have to pay more for the shipping. It's FedEx only. And so we can ship to 44 states in the, in the country right now. Cool. So if you're listening, yeah. that's, I guess, how you support. Get on there, yes. get a bottle of Tina's vodka, yes. try it, let me know what you think. And if you love it, post it on your social support. And if you don't love it, keep your mouth shut. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You're hired. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Tina, uh, where can people connect with you, follow your journey with Tina's vodka? Where's the best place? I would say Instagram right now is the best place. It's much easier for me. It's, a, it's very visual. I haven't set up a TikTok account yet, but I'm going to do that. Um, yeah, I would say, and my website has a ton of information. It's tinasvodka.com and my handle at uh, Instagram is tinasvodka. I keep it very cool. simple. I'll put all that in the show notes there for anyone who's, who's hunting for it. And Tina, okay. what is kind of your final message for people listening to this that are interested in regenerative agriculture, the vodka business or, or, or Tina's vodka? What do you have to say? Yes, I would say definitely watch Kiss the Ground and tell all your friends to watch it because one thing, it will shift the way you think. It tells a different climate story and there's an education that I think we all need because it's not just about being healthy individuals, it's about being healthy collectively and how we all can contribute to that even though you're just one person. And then if you want to get into the liquor business, yeah, um, find somebody who you can talk to about it and figure out what spirit resonates with you because no one needs just to slap their name on a bottle and just try to sell it. People want to resonate with something that's true and authentic within yourself and always be true to yourself. I would say that's the biggest thing, no matter what endeavor you're in and figure out what that is. You know, it's process of evolution. I will tell you going from being a buyer to an owner 
being an employee to a, a business owner has been a huge change in consciousness. It, it just challenges you in ways that you won't expect. <laughs> and the quote of this teacher, he talks about how you're not even creating a business. You're really creating yourself. And the business is the vehicle through which you do that. So be ready for challenges thrown at you. And it's going to test everything you thought you were and push you into a new version of yourself. Tina, that's awesome advice. I want to thank you for coming on the show, having this conversation with me. You're I am welcome. pumped to try Tina's vodka. Yeah. Uh, Got to get me a bottle. And sure. if you're listening and want to want to try it yourself, go ahead and just click on the show notes, grab a bottle yourself and let me know what you think. We'll, we'll have a drink together. Yes. Thanks again, Tina. Thank you. Bye.